Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much indeed for joining us um, for our second Journalism in Crisis uh, webinar um, that we're co-hosting here um, between the Tau Centre and uh, Columbia Journalism Review. My name is Emily Bell. I'm director of the Tau Centre. Uh, I'm joined by Kyle Pope. Hello, Kyle, who's um, publisher and editor-in-chief of CJR. Uh, and Be this here. week... This week we have, um, we're very fortunate to have an amazing international panel with us uh, to talk about what's happening in their own businesses and also regionally, uh, particularly during the um, coronavirus pandemic. Just to remind people who joined us for our first um, webinar last week um, and to tell people who haven't joined us before, uh, we're conducting a project um, at Columbia University between the Tau Centre and CJR, which is attempting to track uh, the changes in newsrooms, both locally, nationally and internationally, uh, in terms of uh, how particularly COVID-19 is, 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 is changing um, newsrooms. Unfortunately, that mostly means cuts, but there, it also has uh, some implications for innovation and um, initiatives, which hopefully are a little bit more um, positive as well. Uh, and last week we heard from people who are collecting this information specifically in the US. Uh, now we want to hear from what's happening um, around uh, the, the, the world. Uh, so I'm really grateful to be um, joined by people who have, particularly Ritu Kapoor, who is the founder of Quintillion um, Media. She's a journalist and entrepreneur in India. Um, she's also co-owner of uh, Bloomberg Quint um, out in India. Uh, and it's a little bit later for her than it is for the rest of us. So welcome, Ritu. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Ricard Ricardo Gandur um, from Brazil, uh, who is uh, now, he's journalism director at CBN Radio, a news radio network there. Um, uh, Tibinyane Tibinyane from Botswana, uh, who is the founder of um, the INC, INK Center for Investigative Journalism out there, um, who is currently in uh, Saskatchewan, which is quite a long way from Botswana, um, but uh, he, he's uh, able to tell us something both about the nonprofit world and uh, how uh, his region is being affected. And last but not least, uh, my colleague uh, Anya Schifrin, who's directly Director of the Tech Media and Communication uh, Program at uh, CEPA, which is our School for International um, uh, Policy here at uh, uh, here at Columbia. So, without further ado, I'm going to go down the line and start with Ritu. Um, and Ritu, I'll, I'll ask you first. Uh, Tell us what's happening in India. How is, how, how is the journalism business being affected there at the moment? Um, how is the Quint doing? What are, you, what are you and your colleagues seeing at the moment? Okay, I'm going to take you a little further back to about three or four months back. Uh, things have been very rocky in the country. Um, it's been a nation sort of in a state of conflict for the last, was, was in a state of conflict three or four months before uh, COVID-19 descended on us. Um, the economy had already been on a downspin. There were already instances of media houses in India doing laying, uh, layoffs. There were already instances of people talking about scaling down or uh, reinventing their businesses. But there was, all, there was just a lot of conversation. And, you know, it was, you sort of don't sort of see the 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 crazy elephant attack you know rushing at you when you sort of keep saying and and i can say that for ourselves as well at the quint we had over time you know we're all of five long years old and uh, we figured that we need to now move away from commodity news because what people are coming to us what our readers are coming to us is for the kind of ground reporting that we do via video and for the enterprise investigative journalism that we are doing but we needed, we needed the push and the nasty shove that we've got with this crisis to actually move to, to, to doing that. And I think that has been the instance for, say, a lot of print and television media, which have always so far seen digital as an add-on to their offering, but you know, had their core uh, focus on their print or broadcast. Uh, and there was this constant talk about digital is the future and we must be there in digital, but all their ad revenue 
conversion and funnels were all aimed at uh, you know their core business, which was print or, uh, or broadcast, and digital was sort of bundled in. Um, so what we are seeing now, and and in the middle of all of this uh, was the communal conflict that was sort of raked up by the government through this whole Citizenship Act, and uh, which was fairly, uh, it sort of was putting the Muslims in the country uh, on, on a, in a very very weak position as far as claiming their citizenship if they did not have documents. Um, you know, even if they'd been there for generations forever, or even, uh, and if they were, especially if they were refugees trying to come back into the country from other places. So it was, we were, we were in a very strange place also in terms of press freedom. So I know there's been a lot of conversation about how COVID-19 has impacted uh, press freedom. I just wanted to give a little context for, we're already not at, we have 142nd in 180 nations in Press Freedom Index already, and there was already a situation where journalists were under physical attack uh, if they were bringing the stories from the ground. So I just want to set the economic and political uh, stage for where we were. And so now where are we? I think it's in all the conversations that I've been having with uh, within the industry, uh, everyone, the large legacy players are trying to now do a serious and as agile a pivot to digital as they can. Um, and in a strange sort of way, of course you're, you're hearing of you know, job cuts, salary cuts, furloughs across. I mean, and, and that's across the large organizations, the small organizations, across news media, because like I said, it was already teetering on the edge before this happened. Um, so, what has happened is most media has now, most large legacy media has now decided to focus a lot more on digital, which means they're now looking at the large cost bases that they have. Um, new media like the Quint is in a slightly better position because A, we were always lean and nimble. Uh, you know, we'd moved to, you know, not having large crews to report from the ground. We were one, one mobile phone, one reporter. We were, we were already set up for that. We already had CMSs, which you could access from very anywhere. You could, you know, be working on your mobile phone. So we're slightly as a digital only um, news media when people like us are slightly better positioned. We've been able to transition almost um, surprisingly, completely seamlessly to work from home. In fact, I have a situation where I'm now trying to gently nudge people to say, listen, how many of you would you would like to be back at work? And partly because of the dread of the virus and partly because I think all of us have discovered how easy it is to work very efficiently. I think at, we, we must have had a seven, five to 7% 7 impact on our productivity. I think the, the video piece is what we are, those are the people we're trying to get back to work uh, for video production because that's a little difficult. Um, the other problem that is going through a start and stop is uh, reporting from the ground. Mm -hmm. So we've, and, and this is such an incredible time to be reporting. This, uh, this is one of the biggest stories to be covering ever. And, and in India, it's not just the health crisis. It's not just looking at how we are prepared or not prepared for the public health and you know, whether testing is happening and whether, you know, uh, people are being tested enough and whether hospitals are really doing the right thing or are, are they being exploitative. That's just one part of the story. The largest part of the story is the migrant labor uh, who've been, who were locked down, who were so desperate to get home because, you know, they could no longer pay rent. They were no longer earning. They were starving. They just wanted to get home to their families. They've been walking thousands of kilometers back. There have been horrific accidents that they have been dying in large numbers. There have been uh, other deaths of people just collapsing. I just read the story of a class seven uh, young girl, you know, on a cycling, on a cycle carrying her injured father for 1200 kilometers. Uh, I, mean, so the, I, mean, I, I don't even want to get into what the what the enormity of the tragedy is and therefore the importance for journalists to be out there in the field and covering the stories. 
Um, the other unfortunate aspect of the story is the communal aspect because, you know, there's been, and that's been sort of drummed up by the right wing, which is that it's the Muslim community that's spreading, that's spreading the virus. It sounds so ridiculous, even if you, you know, even as I say it, but there has been so much prosecution and, you know, people have absolutely decided not to work with, uh, with Muslims anywhere. They've been out of, you know, they're out of their jobs as it is there, you know, there is so little for them to turn to. Um, so it's so important to be reporting to the ground, but there are so many journalists from the ground who have been testing positive. Right. Um, right. So it's been a, it's been a start and stop because right. you know, we're, we're reporting from not very hygienic places or we're, we're reporting from places where people are packed together as sardines. You know, the lacks, lacks of migrant labor assembling in one place trying to get a train ticket to go home. Now, if you're trying to report, and what you're reporting is, look at the hygiene conditions that these uh, people are working in. Um, so, you know, even as I speak, uh, Z News has had 60 people, I, I just heard on, on a WhatsApp, uh, who've tested positive. So there's a lot of dread, you know, as, as, an, as, a, as a media entrepreneur, as a co-founder, you know, what, till, till what point can I risk the health of my uh, team members? Right. Um, right. On, the, on, the, on the ad revenue, we're not behind a paywall, but we've definitely, I think those who were behind a paywall, uh, like Bloomberg Quint was, we've definitely been seeing a surge, not the kind of surge that New York Times is seeing, but a definitive surge of subscriptions uh, lining up. We haven't yet been hit as badly by ad revenue issues, but I think, and no one can predict anything right now, but I think it's going to be in July and September, July, August, September. I think that's when we're going to find out whether it's, you know, it's largely a, just a, just a little bump in, uh, you know, those conversations that we are having with right. people, or is it going to be a, uh, a devastating situation? So in we fact, don't know. Uh, I was, uh, was going to say, that's a great point. Hold that thought, uh, Rishi, because I want to come back um, and ask you yeah. all about, you know, what do we see if, as it were on the other side of this? But it's fascinating to hear, as you say, that advertising has not been hit quite so hard in India, where we, which we see very much as a, as a growth market. Um, Tipin Yane, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, so um, you're in S Saskatchewan, which is some, some distance away, but how have you been managing to keep, um, keep in touch with work and what can you tell us about what's happening um, back at home base? Okay, well, Emily, I think what I'll try to do is to start by uh, looking at how the, you know, the virus has been covered in, 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 uh, in, like in, in, in Africa and then look at what has happened since the outbreak of the virus. And also, finally, I'll look at what we are doing uh, as an, organ an organization. So th there's no doubt, Emily, that uh, the outbreak of the coronavirus is, uh, is the biggest story of the century. It is big in, uh, around the world as it is big in, uh, in, 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 in Africa. And to be honest, since the outbreak, it has been so difficult for many African publications to cover the, the story. But I think there are five main challenges that I've since observed that have made it very difficult for African journalists to cover the, the COVID-19 story. One, access to information is, is a major problem in, you know, in, in Africa. Most African uh, countries have not passed you know, in, you know, basic access to information statutes, and we rely on the goodwill of government to to give us information. They can give us information if they want. They can refuse to give us information if they want. Secondly, production patterns of newspapers have been, have been, disrupt has been disrupted a big time. You know, we have fewer newspapers being printed at the moment as we speak. And as a result, the COVID story is not getting out to the public as it should be. Uh, thirdly, we have the budgetary constraints and travel restrictions that we, we are all experiencing. So what, what, what does it mean? What, what, what it means is that most journalists in Africa are grounded. So they are not out there to, 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 to report you know, stories from different angles. So now what, what is happening is that we are uh, getting you know, information from the government. You know, the government you know, dictates uh, their, their, their agenda. So what we get, what, what we are getting from the government is 
almost the gospel truth. Number four, I think there's little effort by African news rooms to produce data-driven stories about the virus. So the virus came at a time when an African newsroom uh, is not fully prepared to embrace data journalism. So as a result, we have fewer and fewer data-driven stories like on the continent. Number four, also, uh, bit reporting and specialized reporting in Africa is, is, is not common. In fact, in most countries in Africa, we don't have bit reporters, we don't have specialized reporting. So most of our stories, as a result, they lack uh, a depth and proper analysis that you will, you, you, you will find in most uh, power publications. But that, that being said, uh, I don't think it's, it's all doom and gloom. Uh, there are publications that continue to, to cover the COVID-19 story exceptionally well. There are, there, are, there are pockets of excellence all over the continent. For example, if you look at Nigeria, they have a, a, a publication, an online power publication called uh, a Premium Times. They have done well. They have played with data to show how, 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 how the virus has affected Nigeria. Go back to South Africa. They have the Mail and Guardian. They are doing exceptionally well. And what we have also seen is that we have, uh, you know, the, the we, we have seen an increase in in traffic online. We have seen many 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 eyeballs now online, and many people are are online and 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 and, uh, and, and, and participating online. Also, radio and TV on the continent continue to to produce good stories. Maybe not as good as what news 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 newspapers are doing, but radio is still. Uh, reaching out to millions in, 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 in rural areas and remote areas of the continent. And the programming has not been badly, you know, affected as compared to newspapers. But now, what has since happened since uh, 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 the, 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 the outbreak? One, I think major newspapers have temporarily ceased publishing. You know, some have reduced um, their printed copies. Some have completely, sh you know, suspended uh, Power publishing at all. Two, WhatsApp has emerged as the top transmitter of newspaper content. So what is happening is that uh, newspapers, you know, they send their, you know, their, their, uh, uh, it is delivered to so many people as a result. Uh, uh, three, new, new newspapers are also losing millions of dollars in revenue, in advertising re re revenue and circulation revenue. So. The, the other thing, which, which is point number four, again, is that uh, some publications have completely closed shop, permanently closed shop. If you look at uh, South Africa, they have, they have two major media organizations, AMP and Caxton. They have completely shut business. Then they, and in their press statement, they were very, very clear. They were saying, we are closing down shop because of COVID-19. So they are, they, you know, these are publications that have been printed for 50 years and all that. So they have completely shut doors and saying, well, we, we, we can't take it anymore. Uh, number five, some newspapers are already thinking of laying uh, off staff. In, in fact, in Uganda, uh, one news organization called The New Vision, it's, it's, it's a leading newspaper group. They've laid out, in fact, they've laid off uh, around 400 staff members at a go. And they are not promising that these jobs will, you know, will re-emerge after uh, after COVID-19. In Zimbabwe, for, for, for example, uh, major newspapers have cut salaries of staff members by half. In, in some cases, even in Zimbabwe, by around 75%. Another thing which is quite important is that local news and uh, community newspapers are badly affected. In Uganda, for, for example, newspapers, you know, you know, one of the leading newspaper company, you know, they have, uh, you know, since suspended publication of of four papers that are published in local languages, which is, which is a big deal, you know, it's, it's a big deal. So, but one thing that is also, I think we should also uh, talk about is that we have seen the rise in online misinformation and conspiracy theories about this virus and all that. And, and this is partly because uh, of, of the void that has been left by newspapers, because we, 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 we have always seen newspapers as the custodian of of public interest and watchdog journalism, but you know they have vacated the space during this period. Yeah. So what are we doing? So what are we doing as as a centre? A few 
you know, a, a month ago we 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 launched uh, uh, a, a you know a, a, a WhatsApp newsletter that we are that, that, that we are circulating or you know online called the brief. Uh, we have since uh, you know uh, reached out to more than five thousand people through WhatsApp. It is not enough, but we 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 are hoping to increase our base as time goes on. Great, thank you very much. And I think that that point um, uh, that you made uh, right at the end about it's not just about diminution of journalism, it's also about the rise in different types of disinformation, misinformation, yeah. etc. is a really important one that we'll come back to. But I'm um, talk talking of misinformation. Um, Brazil has been uh, in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Um, uh, the unusual distinction of having um, a leader uh, in Bolsonaro who's actually had his content removed from social platforms um, for creating the wrong impressions. Uh, Ricardo, um, we, we, we read snippets about how difficult things are for journalism in, in Brazil. Uh, what's, uh, what, what's the truth of the situation? Yes, Emily. So again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, hi, everyone. I speak from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I am proud to manage uh, the major radio news network. We cover all the country in 48 stations. And um, um, very good to have this opportunity to, to present you a brief of journalism in Brazil. And I'll start a little bit uh, very quickly to, to update you uh, the scenario or local scenario uh, just before the pandemic crisis. Uh, and I'll start uh, talking about the local coverage. Uh, our red alert was uh, on since Atlas da Noticia updated their studies uh, early in February this year. Atlas da Noticia is the Brazilian version of the News Desert Map, uh, a spectacular initiative from CJR. We, we are proud to try to imitate over here. Uh, early in February, uh, this project uh, unveils that 18% uh, uh, of the Brazilian population, which is around 37 million people, has uh, currently no access to local journalism. Uh, uh, just to, 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 to have an idea, uh, to give you an idea, 62% of the Brazilian counties does not have uh, established in a news media outlet locally. Uh, so they, they depend on the national coverage uh, of the TV and radio broadcasting companies. And uh, early this morning, uh, the Brazilian Association of Newspapers updated me that before, uh, after the pandemic uh, from March, more than 20 local papers closed their doors uh, throughout Brazil. So we, we had already been very, very concerned about local journalists in Brazil. And we are uh, sadly sure that this uh, pandemic will, will, things, will make things much, much worse. Uh, according to, the, to the, that uh, research, radio remains the major media in terms of capillarity and coverture of the whole country. Uh, besides open TV, of course. So that's the, the, the scenario we had been observing until February. And uh, uh, we, we, we had also been noticing until February a kind of a news avoidance behavior from general consumer. Uh, we, 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 we see that uh, mainly related to the highly polarization, political polarization scenario we have in this country. And uh, we ourselves as publishers, we, we, we analyze that, that well, we are, we are, people are tired of those things. Uh, in the radio business specifically, we've been noticing an uh, uh, increase in the audience of the music stations in jeopardizing the audience of uh, the uh, all news radio stations. But in March, everything is extremely changed, extremely changed. The, uh, and I, I would like to, 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 to point out that we, what happened uh, uh, after March is that there was a huge impact on, on the media consumer journey, daily journey. Uh, of course, the driving time 
which is very important to radio, disappeared. Uh, people stayed at home. But the, the audience of TV and radio at home increased a lot. And this is supported by Kantar, a metric media company. Uh, this uh, changing in the media consumer daily journey reestablished a very old fashioned behavior of certain families uh, staying together at home, watching TV, watching soap operas, watching the, the, the daily, the, the nightly, the night telejournal, new, news journal. So uh, we, we, we felt, uh, also supported by Kantar, uh, a rescue of an old fashioned content of, uh, of the new, of the old fashioned uh, news schedule, time schedule. Uh, for watching something, for, and um, of course, at home, talking again about radio, the audience increased a lot, uh, especially through the digital channels, the web, uh, the, the, the radio broadcast through digital channels, uh, social networks, uh, the, our, the apps, the websites, and um, this increase is, uh, was noted in all network, and I've been talking about a lot with our affiliates in all the country, and uh, there are double digit uh, growing, so it's very relevant. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, companies had to cut their costs. So uh, it's a very, a very unusual crisis in the business model. We have a revenue stream scaled down with, a, with, a, with the audience very high. So it's very strange. Uh, the media was most damaged by that was the printed media. Many people avoid handling newspapers and magazines and even receiving that uh, at their rooms, the physical merchandise, physical, physical goods. And uh, radio is the media has less uh, damage by revenue, revenue investments. Uh, I, I understand that companies under, uh, uh, think that radio is not that hardly cost media and they are able to maintain their, their voice share without a huge, very huge investment. So, of course, we are suffering a lot, but uh, I would say radio is the less uh, hurted media in this, in this business scenario. Um, of course, uh, uh, some uh, companies, some medium and, big, and, and big companies, uh, made uh, staff agreements to reduce uh, payouts, to reduce uh, income. Uh, there are some news regarding uh, layoffs, of course, but this is the 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 the, the general landscape until March and April. What is what we are we start to notice? Uh, now in May, it's maybe, uh, you know, we have to, to, to carefully, carefully observe a little bit more, but maybe we, sh we will face a new uh, news avoidance wave regarding the virus coverture uh, at right. this time. Yes. People are getting tired. They, uh, everyone learned how to cook, how to keep the house, how to uh, practice yoga, People did everything, but now people are getting tired, and also maybe people are getting tired also uh, of our news cover tour. We are studying that very carefully. Uh, how we're gonna do to try to diversify our angles, to diversify our our news uh, stories? We don't know. Well, uh, last but not least, we uh, we are facing a. Uh, a very complicated scenario regarding our president behavior. And uh, it's quite difficult to have uh, civilized terms to, to, to describe uh, what this elect democratic elected man uh, is doing at the chair. Uh, journalism, of course, is trying to, to bring the ball to the civilized field and uh, trying to, you know, we try to, to make journalists, uh, no, no explanation, but it's very difficult. Uh, he's having a very, very 
inappropriate behavior, especially uh, with the press. Uh, uh, press professionals, journalists are under attack uh, in many circumstances. And, um, and this complicates the scenario even more. Uh, as I, as I know, uh, briefly pointed out, uh, maybe we are, we, are, we, are, we are right now in a new tipping point, right now, middle of May, uh, where people are getting tired of the virus coverture. People are, you know, trying to feed their expectatives for when things will come out again. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe in two or three, or three weeks, we will have another, another things and important things to comment. So that's my brief by now. That's Thank great. You. Thank you very much indeed, Ricardo. Um, Anya, you're taking the broad perspective, global perspective on all of this. Um, and it's great to have these uh, detailed updates from our colleagues around the world. Uh, what are you seeing out there? What are the things that are concerning you? Sure. I did a lot of um, research and homework before, so I have lots to say, but I'll be brief. I just want to say, Ricardo, your point about I think in the beginning, we were all looking at the news all the time, hoping there would be some good news or somebody would say, this isn't a problem or it's just a dream. And then we realized every time we looked at the news, there was no solution. So I think it may also be contributing to the fatigue, right? We kept hoping it's like waiting for that email that tells you something great. Um, so yeah, um, so yes, I checked in with people all over the world, Australia, Bolivia, Mexico, and really I heard a lot of what you're saying, which is that honestly the advertising situation is terrible and newsstand sales have um, collapsed, of course. Uh, Tibignane is being very modest because you didn't mention your terrifying blog post that, you know, there won't be any African newspapers left when this is over. So um, definitely around the world, hearing all kinds of terrible things. Some, but some interesting, I'm always trying to find solutions. So some bright spots. One is um, Julia Caget was saying that media outlets are doing very badly in France, but a lot of, you know, they're not allowed to do layoffs. So I think we can all agree as journalists or former journalists that we love laws that ban people from firing journalists. journalists yeah. um, I'd love to know later, Emily and Kyle, what you think about Australia and France now trying to force Google to pay copyright on news. I think that's a game changer. You know, I've long thought that regulatory solutions have to be a big part of, um, of what we saw, but I, I want to talk about that. In terms of sort of outlets that surviving, I have a few thoughts. One is I read a wonderful piece in Tortoise about how the BBC is suddenly revered again. And so <laughs> oh, they've been pushed back from the break, <laughs> Emily. <Sorry. laughs> I hear you laughing. But, Comes um, and goes, but yes, yes, it's, yeah. been, it's been a good month for the BBC. Yeah, they've become the public square and they've done, you know, Kirsten right. Lang, all this arts programming. So from Boris Johnson had the sort of noose, you know, about to be tightened. Um, I think all the subscription people obviously are going to be, you know, many of them will survive. So media part in France has been doing well because it, it's subscription based. Um, I've written a piece for Kyle Pope and Columbia Journalism Review, which, you know, I consider indispensable reading, by the way, a little plug for CJR, um, about the conversation. And so what the conversation does, right, is academic writing for a regular audience. So they have trained journalists who are taking this dense academic writing and making it readable for normal people. And they've expanded enormously over the last few years. They have you know, multiple offices in Africa, Europe. And what's so interesting about their model is that they get donations from universities, which are partner organizations, as well as from foundations. So I do think you know, part of what the survivors will do is anywhere that they can nest into a bigger institution. So if you're part of a university, or obviously you have foundation money. Um, I'm just finishing editing now a report that my students have done, which was a capstone for Gates Foundation, looking at advocacy and journalism around the world and partnerships. So the Fuller Project in Kenya, Africa Czech in Nigeria, the relationship with, between Gustavo Gorite and Ideale with the anti-corruption movement in Peru and Oxpeckers in South Africa. And as we were doing this report, which obviously started, you know, they're supposed to travel and they couldn't because of COVID, I suddenly thought, my God, I think we're seeing the future of foundation funding. I think that what's going to happen is 
there's going to be, you know, in a resource constrained environment, the foundations are going to want to see impact and bang for buck. And so I think, my, if I had to bet, I think they'll be doing a lot less. I mean, they never did enough of the sort of mm -hmm. funding to keep organizations alive. But if I had to bet, they're going to be focused much more now on those advocacy and earmarked grant making. So I think, I think that's one thing I would bet. And then I had one more thought. Before I, no, no, uh, sure, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm just um, writing a my, note so I don't forget to I'm ask back. you something. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Absolutely. The report will be out soon. It's called Calling for Coalitions is the title my students gave it. Um, and then I guess the other thing I wanted to say also is that, you know, for the last couple of years, and I've talked with Kyle and Emily, and, you know, we've all had these conversations about the big picture solutions, right? So Craig Aaron and the Free Press and their, plan, their you know, attempts to get more local government support for media, or Victor Picard just had this piece in the Washington Post this week um, about, you know, government support for media. And of course, James Dean and Luminate and Mark Nelson have been pushing this big fund idea of getting hundreds of millions of dollars of development aid. So I think it's, again, that thing where we're all so desperate that everybody's thinking big. And we, you know, we don't know what, whether these projects will come to fruition, but it's almost like this last gasp attempt, just like outlets that 10 or 20 years ago wouldn't have taken foundation money now will. People that wouldn't have thought about government support and government help are now open to that idea. So I also think it's a time of you know, big creative thinking and we actually have to make some of that happen so as to safeguard public interest journalism in the future. Yes, that's it. Those are those are great. Those are great points, um, Anya. And I have a thought about your, as you were mentioning, foundations, uh, and I'll be interested in uh, what 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 the um, what all of you think about this. But you know, if we're going to see a wholesale recession in advertising, it opens up some really interesting questions about who is left funding, particularly free media. And in the states, we see that as being at a local level, uh, PACs, so political advertising. Uh, darker money um, in terms of sort of single subject lobbying etc that there's also I think sort of that we, we may be going back to the 19th century where everything was partisan. Kyle I just want to I don't want to forget you you're, you're, um, we, we sort of have an update every week about you know what what your thoughts are when you're um, seeing this coming in from sort of you know particularly around America but all over the world at the moment. Um, what's kind of you know this this point that Ricardo was making about how interest ebbs and flows in the news. Um, it's fascinating to hear um, from Tim and Yanye really about how certain kind of outlets are just disappearing um, in Africa, probably never gonna come back. Um, is there, are you getting any clarity through the fog uh, of um, the crisis about what paths and trends we're seeing sort of emerging from this? No, I think we're still deep in the fog. Um, and it was, it is like really interesting to hear the perspectives from all over the world because the overlap in all of these places of the, of the issues and the challenges everybody's facing is enormous. Misinformation, collapse of advertising. Um, you know, I think that this, this, this uh, you mentioned it, it, but this thing that Ricardo brought up about news avoidance is I, I mean, I think, I think that there's a broader issue here about trust in news. And I think we're in a really precarious place as this, as this virus kind of ebbs and flows, it'll be really fascinating to see how much the news audience blames the media for sort of telling them one, on the one hand that something is happening and then the virus shifts through science, not because of any sort of bad reporting, but I, I just think it's gonna be very difficult. And I think people are getting tired and they're starting to tune out. You know, we think from our perspective in, in as, as journalists and as advocates, advocates for journalism that this is the moment where people should rally around news. This is the moment where they should really appreciate news. I think that there is a danger that it could, that it could go the other way, where people could say, you know what, um, it's all bad. Not only is it all bad, I don't even, it, it changes every day. Um, I don't know who to believe. Um, you know, we're, uh, it's interesting to have somebody from Brazil with Bolsonaro, from India with Modi, from America with Trump. I mean, all of these leaders are trying to feed this idea that um, 
factual reporting about data and science has become a political act and they're trying to turn their audience against news. So it's a very, very, very difficult time and it's a very tricky situation. Just on the business front, I mean, I was, I and a lot of other people were dismayed today in America to see a significant cutback at the Atlantic um, because this was an organization that is funded, that is backed in part by a very, very, very wealthy person. They have been doing amazingly great journalism, especially around uh, the coverage of the pandemic. They seem to be sort of on, going on all cylinders. Um, their subscriptions have been going through the roof. And yet, and yet, they announced today they're cutting, what was it, Emily, 17, 20% of yeah. their staff um, yeah. because their uh, advertising has collapsed. And the other problem that none of us have talked about yet is the events business, which for them was an right. enormous and growing part of their revenue picture, completely gone. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I wish I could say that and the good news out of that is this, but there is none. But it's an important, mm -hmm. it's an important bit of data for those of us watching the U.S. market in particular. Right. Um, so so uh, if you have a question, uh, please put it into q and I'm going to come to those in a couple of minutes, but there were just a, a certain sort of threads there that I um, wanted to pick up. Um, so, you know, this, this idea, um, and Tibiniano, you mentioned, you know, misinformation, and as Kyle was saying, you know, kind of, I'd like to ask all of you, to what extent uh, sometimes this has been framed as an extinction, you know, event for journalism. We all like hyperbolic headlines because we're because we're editors and reporters. Um, but this th this collision of factors, including perhaps um, skepticism and the ability to kind of work on that skepticism through misinformation campaigns or disinformation campaigns. Uh, to what extent do you think sort of journalism is 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 genuinely under threat um, in your markets? You know, particularly because we've seen, you know, we've always thought of India and to some extent Africa as actually growth markets where, you know, journalism has a pretty vibrant future. Um, you know, are your kind of are your views quite as gloomy as as as, as Ricardo's and uh, Kyle's on this? Uh, Timiniano, do you want to take that one first? Oh, sorry, you need to unmute. Okay. Oh, 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 well, I think, uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm a prophet of doom, but I, I think as things are now with massive retrenchment, with print editions being thinner and with newspapers uh, suspending, you know, uh, printing and all that, I, I, I don't see a path, at least, except maybe migrating online and finding ways and experimenting with ways to to, 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 to make money. But as it is at the moment, we are seeing a major uh, extinction exercise at play uh, in Africa. Again, not in all African countries because Africa is not a monolithic, uh, uh, you, know, or, you, know, you, know, you know, country and all that, or, or continent. But I, I, I can see uh, a situation whereby, you know, we are going to have lesser and, and fewer news, newspapers in future. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's already happening. In South Africa, major newspapers or ma ma major print organizations have shut doors and all that. So, so, so we are seeing it at play now at the moment. But again, it's a call for, for innovation. It's a call for, for collision, as Anya was saying. It's a call for, 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 for everyone to come together and find you know, solutions to the problem. Unmute. There, okay. Um, sorry, Rishi. Yes, we had a question actually uh, on on the Q and A about this, which sort of relates to it, which says, you know, um, uh, asked you for disclosure about uh, layoffs in your own company. I mean, I, I'm I'm struggling to think of any media organisation that hasn't laid off people at the moment. Um, so, you know, kind of. Uh, how badly is your business being affected? But also um, this question about, as I say, you know, India, we've often pointed to as being a vibrant, growing market. Um, and, you know, any downturn that's being thought of as cyclical. But these other pressures, um, particularly sort of political pressures, freedom of the press pressures, do you, do you, do you see that um, sort of vibrancy and growth coming back anytime soon? Sorry, uh, uh, Emily, is that a question for me? Because I lost connectivity for- Oh, sorry, for... yes. So, so, so first of all, it was a question so, from the, it was a question from the Q&A, Ritu, which right. said, 
um, that there have been furloughs and layoffs in, in, layoffs. in your own yeah. business. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's just sort of asking to, you to clarify that. And secondly, I was asking, you know, we always think of India as being a great growth market, um, particularly for news uh, and innovative news organizations. Um, and yet some of these other pressures, which are not necessarily just economic, but which are also sort of political as well, seem to cast uh, a shadow over whether or not we can still think about India in, in, in that way, in the growth market for news. What are your, what are your kind of thoughts about those? Yeah, so uh, responding to the first bit about the layoffs and the furloughs at our organization, um, I have to qualify that I have to respect the confidentiality clause that I have with our, uh, with our JB partner as far as Bloomberg which is concerned. So I'm only going to refer to um, those parts of the story that have already been uh, reported in, the, in, in, in popular media. Um, a, overall, it's important to understand that in both the businesses, uh, we, are in, uh, we are still at the investment stage and uh, we are self-funded. Uh, of course, the JV is you know, co-funded as well, but uh, the Quint is completely entirely self-funded. And uh, the ad revenue uh, that, we, that I was referring to is obviously just still, uh, because we're at such an early stage of our build out of our growth, it's just a fraction of what our costs are. Um, now, so the only part of the 100 people being laid off that I can refer to is, you know, we, it, was a, it was a joint venture between Bloomberg and us for digital and for broadcast. So uh, about four years ago, we set up to be a broadcast, we set up for broadcast. So the entire, you know, studios and, and you know, everything that goes into setting up for broadcast, which uh, I'm sure everybody understands what those costs are like there. And uh, we've dealt with, you know, regulatory chokes for independent journalism is well known um, in India like it is in, in, in Brazil. Um, and so for, for three years, uh, we, we sort of set up this entire broadcast network, but we just did not get, uh, you know, the regulatory cho chokes just did not allow us to launch the channel. So the layoffs, it's just a coincidence that the layoffs coincided with the unfortunate crisis, which is a very unfortunate time to be taking a job away from anyone. Uh, it just so coincided, but actually it is the... Sh it is us finally figuring that we cannot fight that legal battle or that regulatory battle anymore. We will not get the license and we cannot launch the channel, which is why the team that was brought together to launch the channel, right. uh, we had to let go. Um, and, and as far as the Quint is concerned, we're still at the investment stage and we are a very feisty uh, we speak truth to power. We are we are very very independent. We we do not have to you know, which is why we are very limited in the kind of advertising we look at. We definitely don't have any government advertising, which um, and 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 you come to a point where you have to choose between being independent and the fact that to be independent you have to survive. Uh, and those are some of the calls that you take because those are these you know nobody sets up anything to 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 do terrible things to people. Okay. So uh, I hope that unfortunately I cannot go into a lot of detail because as I mentioned, sure. there's a lot of I I, it's it's actually a good point as well to sort of ask um, generally, and Anya sort of touched on this, which is this question question um, uh, from uh, a participant. Uh, which is what are the other revenue streams um, that we could look to? So, Anya, you mentioned uh, foundations. Uh, we've seen small amounts of money from the big platforms, which are sort of beneficently given, but perhaps they should be uh, forced perhaps to more. We've seen the regulatory intervention from uh, Australia and France signalling a kind of a change of temperature in how some governments are. Uh, viewing this, what do, what do people see in their sort of regions as being, if advertising is no longer going to be the thing that supports the majority of free media, what are our answers to that? What Do we have any answers to that? What do we have to do as a collective industry across the world to address that? Who wants to take that first? Ricardo, you're nodding. Um, so I'm going to come to you. 
Yeah, um, first, may, may I quickly underline uh, uh, Kyle Pope's point that what amazes us is that uh, credibility, media credibility is high right now in Brazil, uh, according to Datafolia and Counter poll, recent, very recent polls. And um, uh, so this is, this is, uh, this is very in incredible, but even, even though we are noticing, and I, as, I told, as I told you, it's a very new thing, a new wave of news avoidance. Uh, we have to study that more carefully. Uh, another interesting episode that happened here, which will rest, of course, for the journalism story books, is that the, the Brazilian franchise of, of CNN started in the very week, first week of quarantine. Uh, so they, uh, they had huge difficulties to propose their identity to the public exactly in that period. I remember when I opened a local, a new local paper here in Sao Paulo in the very week of the September 11 uh, attack. Uh, so I, I couldn't realize one day in my life, I, could, I would see a whole edition dedicated to one theme from politics to sports and culture. So that's why we need to study carefully uh, the consumer, the media consumer behavior to see how we will, we will, we will survive, how, how we will, and talking to the point, how you, 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 you take the biggest learn ships and uh, to innovate, to do things different, uh, maybe more home office, um, maybe in a hybrid scheme, uh, the, the, the interface with the sources had dramatically been impacted so uh, for sure, we have many, mess many lessons to take from all of this. That's actually, again, a good point to uh, pick up on uh, a question uh, from um, one, of our, one of our participants, I'm sorry, which I've just uh, lost who it is. So apologies for stealing your question, but I'm getting it out of the Q&A, which is, you know, the, the, the good news portion of this, which I do feel that we do have some uh, duty to keep our uh, viewers, you know, from complete despair. Um, which is this idea of like, what are the ideas that we are seeing? Um, you know, uh, uh, Nitin Banya, yeah, you, you mentioned you have a WhatsApp. You just started small with a, a lower cost, different way. Are there a, a other sort of, are there other innovative um, solutions that you're seeing um, in Africa uh, where you go, actually, that's, that's kind of, this is forcing us to look at the future um, in a slightly different way and those types of innovations, whether it's, format or partnerships or, or, or support of other types? I mean, yeah, I think what we are, we, 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 you know, we are trying to do, my uh, organization and, uh, and other, you know, uh, journalists and uh, owners around, is to do two things. One is to uh, work on a situation whereby we want to lobby governments in Africa you know, to extend tax breaks to, to news organizations, in particular newspapers, to ask governments to exempt newspapers and other news organizations from paying VAT, and also to lobby governments from, uh, you, know, you know, to reduce uh, 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 internet and electricity tariffs for newspapers and other organizations. This won't save, you know, newspapers but I think it will buy time one. It will save jobs, you know, like in the meantime. And it will also allow newspapers to migrate gradually, you know, online. One thing that I will also want to do is to lobby governments uh, to call for taxation. Uh, you know, perhaps lobby governments, African governments through uh, the African Union, that they should compel technology giants such as Google, Facebook, and all that. Uh, you know, to pay companies for profiting from their originally produced uh, a, a copy. And this revenue should be used to support struggling uh, news, newspapers. I, the, the other thing, the third one is to tax them, to tax them for doing business in Africa, because they are not being taxed. They are just uh, stealing money from Africa and going, you know, all out and some even taking the money to, to offshore accounts and all that. So we we, but this will take uh, a very, uh, in fact, it will take time. It will need, you know, the, the modernization of our tax laws. Uh, 
Yeah. So, so this is what I think, you know, together with my organization, together with other organizations are trying to do, besides trying to appeal for more funding from donors, we think uh, a government has a role, we think the African Union has a role, and we think taxation is the way forward. Right. Right. So, so those are really big. So we think of innovation, you know, as being bits of software or whatever, but actually being innovative in policy at the moment seems to me to be like probably the most important thing. Um, uh, Ricardo, I know that you're uh, uh, actually, Rita, I'll come to you um, first on this again. Uh, you're a kind of uh, an entrepreneur uh, and spotter of trends and, 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 and things that might get us out of this. You know, where should we be innovating? Where do you see bright spots? Um, I think I think we have to now, and I and I'm saying this more from the point of view of what I what I'm looking at at my organization. I think one of the areas that um, journalism just didn't focus for very long was tech, which is why the tech platforms uh, did what they did because there was a sort of a tacit understanding that we would provide the value, uh, the public good, which is uh, news and. Uh, analysis and opinion and uh, ground reporting. And uh, this will be our distribution partner, but over some point, we just let the equation go awry. I think one of the things that we will have to do, which uh, you know, some of the other panelists have also spoken of, is now, you know, there are, there are sort of funds being set up by the tech platforms, but I don't think that's what we're looking at. I think we need a fair exchange of value now. And I think those are the conversations that's so important for in countries if, if it's not being uh, determined by the state regulation, then it has to be uh, media houses coming together and speaking to whatever extent in one voice, you know? And I think that's the only way we'll be able to address that. That's one large thing. I think right now in the more immediate sense, we don't know what the revenue uh, models that are going to emerge. I mean, there's a lot of thought there, but I think one of the innovation needs to be on cost saving right now. Um, you know, for instance, we're realizing that, like a lot of other people, that we had two large floors in our office. We'll actually be able to manage in one, perhaps. Uh, in the process of this two months of a lockdown and working from home, we've discovered so many tools and apps, and there's so many fantastic ways of creating multimedia, um, which you can now innovate further on. Um, and while we are not investing on anything else, we try to cost save somewhere, what is very clear to me is that we need to focus a little more in, in uh, investing or building out and growing the tech because tech is such a large enabler in getting your content out. The, the most important thing, and this is just wishful thinking, is people will need to start paying for news. And they will pay, and you have to, the question you have to say is, why will people pay for news? Why do people pay for a certain, certain a drug company and not another drug company, even in the middle of such a crisis? Because there's credibility and there is, there's a distinct quality of journalism that you have to offer. What is it that people will pay for? And, uh, you know, we're one of the few people and there are just a bunch of other freelance journalists who are currently out on the roads reporting from the migrant crisis, from the health crisis. There is, because broadcast, Unfortunately, in India has just become opinion. And uh, unfortunately, there's also a lot of partisanship. There's a lot of covert propaganda as well. So we are finding, I mean, one of the innovations that we haven't come up with during the COVID crisis, but we built it out over some time was our partnership with our readers on fact checking and our partnership with our readers on citizen journalism. So we know that a lot of the fake news, for instance, and incredibly so during the COVID-19 crisis, if, uh, circulates in the dark web, and I'm referring to WhatsApp, which mm -hmm. is end-to-end -end encrypted, so you don't know what the source is. So we set up over the last one and a half, two years, a relationship with our readers, which is that, listen, if you come across something on your WhatsApp feed, please share it with us. We we'll do the fact checking and send it back to you. Um, similarly, we had built a you know, team of citizen journalists who we had mentored and verified and worked closely with. And because of that, we're able to get stories from across the country because at a time that journalists cannot travel uh, or cannot travel far enough. So those are the kind of innovations. And so the cue to me from that is innovate much more because you can't be on a, on a you know, cost save and quietly sort of be in a decline mode. 
this is also the time that you have to also grow and accelerate so how do you do that while you're cutting costs so for instance for us we figure that we don't need commodity news so we've cut down all the money we were spending on subscriptions to wire services right. and and as we've done that we've actually seen that we're growing we've actually decided that we're going to get out of this keywords trending topics this is going to soar this is a trend you know just completely get out of that entire you know mugs game and we're finding that audiences are coming to us for much deeper engagement so i think this is also time to really open your eyes and see what is it that the reader wants a much deeper relationship with your audiences need to be uh, need to now be built yeah i think that's a great point actually it's um uh ricardo do you have anything to say on that or kyle maybe um in terms of things that you're seeing that are kyle you've well switched I, your think, microphone. I, think, I think reader makes a really good point about um I mean, I actually have seen some, what I think are improvements in the digital presentation of a lot of these big news outlets, which I think, yeah. in, let's be honest, I mean, a lot of the websites of most, especially most newspapers have been not great. Um, but I think you know, the, the, the scale of the story has been such that they've had to rethink some of the presentation. I mean, you're seeing like really interesting, um, like, you know, I know the New York Times and Washington Post, and they do these kind of basically sort of I don't know what they, what you call them, sort of just aggregated long scrolls that you can just sort of like catch up on everything that's happening. And the presentation, I think they've made some advances. I've also, I, I think there's also been some um, improvement in the use of an understanding of data and data visualization in, in, on these websites. I mean, because this all, you know, a lot of this is a data story when you look at, you know, the, the curves and the cases and whatever. And, and again, like, there's been, you know, we we and others have complained for a long time that there's like, that, you know, we, and we really saw this play out in 2016 in the U.S. election as it relates to polling data. There's just been a general lack of understanding in newsrooms about how to use these numbers and how to portray these numbers. And I think I think we're seeing a lot of, a lot of real improvements that I hope will stick. So I think that's something that's positive that's come out of it. And right. so yeah. one, one other thing along that line yeah. is you're also seeing a lot of these big news organizations be a lot more willing to ask for ideas from their audience. So you see, you know, the Times is now saying like, if you're a nurse in a New York City hospital, please get in touch with us because we want to know what's happening on the ground. You didn't see that so much before. And I think that's great. Yeah, I think one of the um, really interesting things in terms of our students at Columbia Journalism School, uh, one of the great skills that they've had to learn is to teach sources how to report and you know everything, nothing nothing is new so you know we work very hard on citizen journalism in The Guardian back in sort of 2005-2006 but I think that Ritu um, and Kyle those are great points about how actually you know teaching and working with communities where you can't get to um, actually has a great deal of value in it which to some extent we sort of you know, forgotten about maybe a bit in newsrooms. Um, I want to just get to work. Look, we've gone over a little bit. Um, I don't want to go over too far, so there's just a couple of questions I want to get to uh, from the Q&A. Thank you very much. Some, some great questions here. I hope we've answered some of them um, that have come up in that conversation. I just want to come back to disinformation because uh, uh, Jim Dingerman has asked a good question, which just says, um, the disinformation question is just not a new one, but it's alarming um, in the way that it's in increasing, uh, the increasing use of disinformation COVID-19 pandemic um, coupled with uh, the political um, agenda. Uh, what are the best practices to counter this? I think this is something that we all go round and round in um, uh, uh, circles on. Uh, Ricardo, can I sort of start with you on that? And I'm going to come to Anya on this as well, because she's been studying this in particular. So, Ricardo, to, to, sure. The well, the remedy here, we know, is checking, checking, checking in offering to the public checkered versions of everything was disinformed. Uh, we, no other way. It's a hard task every day, every hour, checking, checking, checking. Uh, uh, may, I, may I comment two quick points? Yeah, sure. uh, yeah. Pending from other talks. Um, uh, regarding to cost structure, uh, it's, um, it's uh, incredible how we see in this two last month uh, uh, increase in the productivity. Uh, although it's always very difficult talking about productivity in journalism because, you know, output uh, is not very well related to the efficiency. 
it's a very sensible thing, uh, very common in other industries, but not in journalism. But again, it, it happened. And, uh, and I see, uh, this is an in, uh, internal process of speaking. In terms of business model and funds, as uh, someone uh, asked, uh, I see in Brazil, I truly believe in a hybrid model, non-profit and for-profit sectors collaborating together to support uh, media outlets. And that's, a, that's a great point. So, Anya, can you weigh in on the whole, how do we fight disinformation? <laughs> You'll have to un unmute yourself. That's the first step. That's very, um, that's very generous, Emily, because as you know, I've, like everybody, I've been actually writing about this for a couple of years and now working on a book on this subject. So um, I think the sort of range of things everyone's trying include news literacy, fact checking, trying to get at the business models so that people don't make money off it, pressuring Facebook to take down, down rank, offering counter content, like what YouTube has been trying to do, um, and then legal, legal measures, like what Germany has done with the NetSDG law of actually making the platforms responsible. My thinking on all of this has really shifted in the last couple of years. I'm much more pro-regulation than I was before. Um, I think it's absolutely in this country we need to make sure that people, you know, I don't want to say can't, yeah, have the right that if they need to sue, Section 230 should be carved out. So I've, I've really shifted. Um, one thing I thought was fascinating that I heard last week was Renee DiResta talking about really what, you know, Kyle's talking about, that there's this uncertainty, the unsettled science has confused people. And they were saying that the problem is, you know, if you join a baby food making group online, you will immediately start getting anti-vaxxer right. messages. Yeah. But the WHO, is not going into young mother groups for their messaging. And so she was making this point that there's a total uh, disconnect between how all this garbage is circulating and the sort of official institutions and how they put their messages forward. Right. Yes, we yeah. ju we've just had a class on exactly this. And one of the key skills that my mm. students were learning is how to report from inside things like closed WhatsApp groups and closed yeah. Facebook groups, how to do it ethically and how to, uh, and I've also seen some work recently suggesting that if you just constantly correct people when they get things wrong, it eventually has a greater effect than putting something like a fact check on it, etc. The one thing I would say is that, mm. and Anya knows this better than almost anybody else, it's a, it's a very, nobody's going to solve this problem. And also there's a very thin evidentiary basis for some of the things that we're told will work. Um, right. They don't necessarily actually work. Um, so so yeah. there's I don't know. I don't know if I, know, uh, I don't know if Ritu or um, Tim and Yanni want to. So, so if I, if I yeah. could just come in, I think one of the things that uh, one needs to do with just with just uh, with the fact check is to not just let it sit on your website. Right. Like I'm saying, yeah. it needs to be. So what we do is, if somebody sends us a story that's that we that he, that she or he wants fact check, we give his uh, the fact that you know so and so from Mumbai flagged this fake news. And then we send him an email right back to him uh, so that he can then circulate with his sort of, you know, sort of right. say little na his name out there. That's one. The second is that if there is the, the fake news is trending to certain keywords and it's sort of going up, is to publish the fact checked piece with similar keywords so that it picks up on the same trend and it tries to ride on the same virality. And the third thing is. Uh, which is what we do because we have WhatsApp channels, publishing channels that we have, so to say, uh, uh, is to push the same fact check content on the same platforms, on the same dark web spaces where the fake news is doing the rounds. It's still, I mean, the armies of uh, fake creating fake news are so vast and so huge that this is like perhaps like a little ant trying to bite uh, the elephant, but let's hope we're biting in some of the right places so that we're right. being, being able to have an effect, effect. The other thing is the literacy, because you're not just about news literacy, but about partisanship and polarization, because that's what feeds fake news. And that's one of the things that's really important to do, uh, I feel, alongside mm -hmm. all of this. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, I also think, again, in the, in, 
in our world here in, Af oh, in, in, in Africa, we, we have uh, a few fact-checking organ organization, country-specific organizations. Besides Africa Check and others, there are very, very few fact-checking organizations. I think there is need now to expand the fact-checking fact organizations in, in, our, in, you know, in our different uh, countries. And also I think what is important is to make fact-checking organizations or platforms more accessible to the public. They are accessible to journalists, but if you make it more accessible to the public, I think we'll be able to, to, to fight uh, this misinformation as gauge. No, I think that's a great point. So I am going to wrap, we have gone over, but I'm just going to wrap up now with my favourite question, which comes up in every session, but it's very important um, that, that we answer it, particularly given that we're based at Columbia Journalism School. Um, from Catherine Sullivan, so thank you, Catherine. Um, as a young journalist just graduating from college, congratulations. Uh, what is the most important skill or trait that I should be working on in order to make myself valuable during this crisis? That's a great question. Who wants to take that one first? Yes, Ricardo. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's good to, to know that. I, I've been teaching for undergrads uh, journalist classes here in Brazil, and it's so good to talk to the new people. But I would say uh, independence and curiosity, uh, personal independence and curiosity. Do that track and, uh, and things will happen. I, that's I would say very briefly. Yes, pull, pull, pull the piece of string longer and harder than anybody else until you see what's at the end of it that's very good advice yeah from from my end i think it's simple do everything be the jack of all <laughs> trades <laughs> be the jack of all trades you know take pictures write news you know operate a camera you know go into mobile journal journalism do everything very Don't good advice. Yourself, yeah. i just say that you know just arm yourself with uh, flexibility and ability of as many cheap and cheerful tools that you can to make it's not just it's not just about getting your story it's about making people uh, wanting people wanting to read your story in the way you've told your story and in a time of infodemic and too much uh, uh, everywhere also look for the story that nobody else is telling yes you know that is so yes. critical yes um, absolutely Absolutely. Absolutely. To what uh, Ricardo uh, said, just that point. Absolutely, Anya, as you, with your professional educator hat on. Um, I agree with everything, and then I would add sharp, clear writing, especially because I'm in a policy school. Yes. Uh, that's really important. We do like sharp, clear writing in a journalism school as well. I would just say. <laughs> but oh. I, I mean, we have a shortage of it because. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll not, I won't comment. Our, our, our writing is generally better, I think, but even so, it's, it's a good point. Kyle? I, I would really, I mean, not, people may not have a lot of choices, but I would really encourage them to be um, creative in terms of, like, like, basically getting out of the media centers. Um, I, I still see, su surprisingly, a lot of reluctance, um, especially for students who go to school um, on the coast to sort of, you know, being willing to go to perhaps smaller markets in other parts of the country. And increasingly, I think, you know, there, on the one hand, there's fewer jobs, but you know, th there's such enormous uh, opportunity for growth in those places. And you learn so much and you're able to like do stories that really matter to people. So, you know, try to get out of whatever, whatever conception you have about what your job is going to be like when you graduate from school, try to break out of that. Yes, I always like to tell students that when I uh, graduated, um, I went to be a trainee on an agricultural magazine, which even though it was even though it was based in London, I had to go kind of all over the country and hear people's stories. And somebody that uh, I graduated with was going to Vogue. And after six months, we met and I had been covering parliamentary committees. I had been doing what they call, you know, kind of like tragedy stories and talking to people who had lost their spouses in accidents. I've done, you know, I'd, I'd been up mountains. i had been standing usually in cow manure. Um, and I said, what have you been doing? And she said, I've been making tea. And I think that that's, that's the thing, get, get out um, and find those stories because they are everywhere. Um, and thank you for studying journalism. Any stu students on here will try and make the industry better. 
uh, to receive your skills wherever you are in the world. So I just want to say thank you. It's so great to have these international perspectives. We don't do it nearly enough. We should do it more often. I'm going to try and hold our panelists to a promise to come back maybe in a few months um, so that we can kind of revisit all of these conversations and uh, see where we are. But thank you so much, everybody. Thank um, you. Participating today. Thank you so much. Thank great you so much.